The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar titled, There's No Such Thing as a Valid Test, presented by Dr. Dylan William. My name is Beth Carr, Senior Director of District Partnerships, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we start, I have a few helpful reminder for today's webinar. Can we change the screen? Okay. Our webinar today is scheduled for just shy of one hour. Your audio lines are muted during the presentation. However, we welcome your questions and comments. This webinar is typically, or excuse me, is specifically designed to engage with you in a productive conversation on the topic. Please submit your questions by using the GoToWebinar question pane located on your screen. Finally, today's webinar will be recorded with a link distributed to you via email. Feel free to share the presentation with colleagues who were unable to attend. Without any further delay, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Dylan William. Dylan is the best-selling author of Creating the Schools Our Children Need, an embedding formative assessment with Siobhan Leahy, among other books. He's also head of the Dylan Williams Center, which sponsors the Formative Assessment National Conference held this July in Baltimore, Maryland. Dylan? Thank you, Beth. So I entitled this webinar, There is No Such Thing as a Valid Test, because that seems to be one of the kind of misconceptions that I see very commonly um, being expressed in terms of assessment. So uh, I want to take you through several things today. One is um, why there's no such thing as a valid test. I'll also be hoping that you understand why it makes no sense at all to talk about reliability and validity. And then following on that, that there's no such thing as a reliable test either. I want to spend some time talking about progress measures in particular, because many schools in the US and indeed elsewhere are relying on progress measures to see whether students are making adequate progress. And I want to highlight the fact that these are often quite unreliable for individual students, even though they can be very useful for groups of students. And then finally, a few thoughts about why we need to take seriously the consequences of educational assessments. But these initial assumptions I want to make are that really assessment should be a servant rather than a master. So any assessment system should be designed to support the school's curriculum rather than having to shoehorn the curriculum to fit into the school's assessment system. And since any school's curriculum is always essentially a local undertaking, it needs to be embedded into the local context, there can't be a one-size-fits-all assessment system. Schools will need to evolve their own assessment solutions for their own needs. And that means that every single school's assessment system will be different. But I think it's really important to acknowledge there are some principles here that should govern the design of assessment systems. And I think assessment is different from many other fields in that there is some science here. There are some things that we know and that you can make statements around our assessment that are not just kind of not shared by other people, but that are just plain wrong. And this is quite unusual because in education, there are a lot of opinions. Some people think that ability grouping is good. Some people think it's bad. There's no real kind of way of proving people that it's either right or it's wrong. There's lots of things like that in education. But in assessment, there are a number of things that is really important to understand because if you don't understand these things, you end up saying to students, to parents, to carers, things that are just not, just not, in, just not correct. Okay, so before we can assess, if assessment is to serve learning rather than to be the, the master of learning, then I think we have to think about what do we want to assess. So the starting point for any assessment system has to be what do we want to know about? Where do we want our students to get to? The big ideas of a subject. And then we need to think about the learning progressions. What are the steps that students typically take to get to a particular place? And recently in the US, there's been lots of interest in learning progressions. The thing to remember about learning progressions is that they are almost always a consequence of the way that students have been taught. And because often there is no right sequence to teach things in, you can actually teach different topics in different sequences and students will learn things in different ways. So again, learning progressions, while they can be shared amongst schools and districts, they're often much more to do with these particular sequence of activities that a student has followed rather than being absolute 
sequences of learning. Uh, for, for example, we always think that multiplication should be taught before division. And if you want to use a computational approach, then that's correct, because multiplication is easier to teach than division. It turns out that division is conceptually easier than multiplication. So if you ask students to construct stories concerning mathematical statements, you say to them, you know, three plus four equals seven. And the child might say, Jane had three sweets and John had four sweets, and they added them and they had seven between them. And you get the same children a question like 12 divided by 4 equals 7. So 12 divided by 4 equals 3. Can you construct a story about that? The students will say, well, there were 12 suites and they're shared between four people. And they got three each. But if you ask the same students to construct a story concerning multiplication, 3 times 4 equals 12, many students will say, Jane had three suites and John had four suites, and they times them and got 12. So it seems that conceptually, division is easier to understand than multiplication. What that means is that some teachers might choose to teach division as a conceptual idea before multiplication. And in that case, the students will learn things in a different sequence. So the important thing to realize is learning progressions are very important, but they may not be universal, even in mathematics, let alone in other areas where the sequence in which we teach students things is much more up for grabs and needs to be determined by judgment rather than by any kind of logic in the subject. Once, however, we've got those learning progressions, then we need an assessment system to identify where are the use, useful checkpoints? Where should we stop and make sure the students have reached this particular point? And that gives us the kind of architecture of an assessment system. The idea is that an assessment system should be helping us figure out where the students are in their learning and where they need to go next. And I think the most important idea here is that any assessment system that tries to capture everything that students are learning is going to be completely useless because it's going to be completely it's far too complex to be useful. So one of my favorite quotations here comes from the work of the statistician George Box. And he said that all models are wrong, some are useful. The point he's making is that any model of a scientific situation is a simplification. And therefore, it cannot be an accurate model. What it can be is useful. And here there's a quote here, since all models are wrong, the scientist cannot obtain a correct one by excessive elaboration. On the contrary, following William of Ockham, he should seek an economical description of natural phenomena. Just as the ability to devise simple but evocative models is a signature of the great scientist, so over-elaboration and over-parameterization is often the mark of mediocrity. I think that's a really important thing for us to, to bear in mind as we design our assessment systems. Our assessment systems have to be simplifications of reality. The question is, are they useful? And there's a, a passage from a book written by Lewis Carroll, who is best known for his book, Alice in Wonderland, from a book called Sylvie and Bruno Concluded. And there's a rather stark reminder of why we need models. So there's a quotation that begins, that's another thing we've learned from your nation, said Meinherr, map making. But we've carried it much further than you. What do you consider the largest map that would be useful? About six inches to the mile. Only six inches, exclaimed Meinherr. We very soon got to six yards to the mile. And then we tried a hundred yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to a mile, to the mile. Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, said my hair. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it does nearly as well. So that's the important point. Uh, like a map simplifies details to enable us to navigate. An assessment system should simplify reality, keep the important details so that we can actually decide whether our students need particular kinds of interventions to make progress. And so when we design these simplified models, these learning progressions, we need to be very clear about what we are looking for. And so, for example, in reading, there's generally quite strong consensus that there are five elements that get better when students get better at reading, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and text comprehension. And so we might choose to keep track of a student's progress in each of these dimensions. I quite like this model from Hollis Scarborough, which shows how increasing language competence involves a huge range of different things being articulated together. And 
I've called this slide the simple view of reading because recent research suggests that at the very simplest level, an awful lot of our understanding about students' development in reading can be um, pinned down by just two things. One is decoding and the other is listening comprehension. So if students could understand something, if it was spoken to them, and if they can convert letters to sounds, then that pretty much gives us a very good handle on how good they are at reading. And so the very simplest level, that, that model of the simple view of reading is basically just decoding and listening comprehension, gives us a very simple model of the things we might check to see whether a student needs one kind of intervention or another. So the important point is, we devise our assessment systems according to the models that we find useful in directing teaching. So this is a model from Hollis Scarborough. There's a slightly more sophisticated model from Daniel Willingham in his book, The Reading Mind. And I think this is a very powerful model, but it, again, it helps us to take a, the incredibly complex phenomenon of reading and identify a, cute, a few key elements about what it is that's developing in a student's comprehension abilities. And then we can hopefully intervene more effectively. The important point is the model has to be as simple as possible but no simpler. That phrase is often attributed to as, uh, Albert Einstein. We have no evidence that he said it, but it's a good phrase. Make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. The problem, of course, is we often use these models in multiple ways, which make them rather confusing. So for example, I was working in a district where the superintendent wanted to know whether students were making progress or not. So they decided to institute a system of formative assessments. So every Friday, the students would be tested on what they'd learned that week. And the idea was that that would help the teachers figure out what students had learned and which interventions to make if students were making the progress required. However, many of the teachers believed that these measures, these Friday tests, would be used to evaluate the teachers. And so what many of the teachers started doing was drilling the students for the tests on Wednesday and Thursday. So although the tests had originally been intended to serve entirely a diagnostic function, because some people suspected they might be used evaluatively, they completely distorted what was happening in the classrooms. And they lost three days teaching because they were spending Monday and Tuesday teaching new content, Wednesday and Thursday preparing for the tests and Friday testing. So we have to understand that when we use assessments in multiple ways, one use can distort the others. And to help us understand these issues, I've kind of fleshed out what I think is going on in most schools by thinking about three functions that assessment might serve. Instructional guidance, sometimes called formative assessment, how we describe individuals, summative, and then the use of assessments to hold institutions, teachers, curricula to account, which we might call evaluative. And if we actually look at different timescales, hourly, daily, weekly, interim, and annual, we can populate this graph by thinking about the high stakes accountability like state tests. We can think about end of course exams, growth measures, and end of unit tests. And we can think of things that are much more instructionally focused, academic promotion decisions, benchmarks, common formative assessments, maybe a, a, unit a test before the end of a unit, an exit pass at the end of a lesson, or a question that a teacher asks in the middle of a lesson, at the hinge point in the learning, should I go forwards or go back? What Madeline Hunter called a, a check for understanding. And just to highlight how I think we should be emphasizing different aspects of these differently, I've put in a tint there to show that I think that most of the, the weight, the, most of the effort should go into the upper part and the left-hand part of the graph, not the bottom right-hand part of the graph. That helps us um, map out the terrain and helps us understand maybe that some uses of these assessments may actually get in the way of other uses of the assessments. So often what we need to be doing is to st stop assessments doing more than one job because when they used to do more than one job, like the formative ass assessments in the district I just mentioned, they often distort the other uses that can be made of those same assessment results. So 
With that said, let's move on to the, the big idea here, which is getting assessment right. And so an assessment, in my view, is simply, as Lee Kronbach pointed out many years ago, a procedure for making inferences. We give students things to do, we collect evidence, and we draw conclusions. So the key question for any assessment is, once you know how the student has done on the assessment, what do you think you know? And for any test, some inferences, some conclusions are warranted, valid in other words, and some are not. And this, I think, is the key insight. Because for many years, we thought that validity was a property of a test. So from the 1930s onwards in the United States, the standard definition of validity was a test is valid if it assesses what it purports to assess. The trouble with that definition is that a test doesn't purport anything. A test just tests what a test tests. The purporting is done by people who can claim that a particular test result has a particular meaning. So over the last 50 years or so, the definition of validity has shifted from a property of a test to a property of student scores on a test. And then finally, and I think probably now in, in the standard view in assessment, validity is a property of inferences or conclusions drawn on the basis of assessment results. So as Lee Kronbach said in 1971, what gets validated is not a test, but an interpretation of data arising from a specified procedure. And this is why there is no such thing as a valid test, a valid assessment, because validity is not a property a test can have. It is what Gilbert Ryle called a category error. It's like describing a rock as happy. A happy rock is a category error because happiness is not a property that rocks are capable of possessing. And in the same way, validity is not a property that tests are capable of possessing because some conclusions may be valid and some not. Let me give you an example. Let's say we have a mathematics test with a very high reading demand. The problem with that test is that it might give you valid inferences about students' abilities in mathematics if those students are good readers, but if students are poor readers and they get low scores on the test, you don't know whether the reason for their low scores is because they couldn't read the test questions or because they couldn't do the mathematics. So in other words, this test would support valid inferences in the case of good readers, but it wouldn't support valid inferences in terms of the weaker readers. So that's why validity cannot be a property of a test, it's a property of the conclusions. So when somebody says, is this a valid test? The immediate response should be, you tell me what you propose to conclude on the basis of these assessment results, and I will tell you whether that is legitimate or not. So the idea is that validity is a property of the conclusions we draw from a test and its outcomes when we give it to students, not of the test itself. What this also means is there's no such thing as a biased assessment because bias is a property of inferences. And this gets people very confused because some subgroups in the population score lower than other subgroups on certain tests. And people say that test is biased against that population. But if, that, if, the, if the lower scoring group, it really is not as good as, at this, then those tests are not biased. It's the conclusions that they might actually be better at something else that is biased. So bias, again, is a property of the conclusions we draw because a test just tests what a test tests. The decision to use that test in a particular context for a particular purpose and to assume that test result has a particular meaning, that is biased or potentially biased. It also helps clarify for me the relationship between formative and summative assessment. Because I think the best way to think about formative and, and, and summative is as kinds of conclusions we draw from the basis of test outcomes. Formative and summative are descriptions of inferences, not of assessments. So let me give you an example. Let's say I give a mathematics test to a group of students and I notice that one student gets 10 out of 20. I'm giving them a test on their number facts and it's 100 of them 
And on the basis of the 20 samples, the, the, the sample of 20 I've drawn at random, that student gets 50% of them right. So it's a reasonable conclusion for me to say, I reckon that student knows about 50% of his number facts. That's a summative conclusion. If I notice he seems to be having particular difficulty with a seven times table, that gives me some guidance about what to do next with that student. So that is a formative inference or a formative conclusion. In other words, the same assessment and the same assessment information can be interpreted summatively or formatively. So formative and summative are descriptions of conclusions that we draw on the basis of assessment outcomes, not of the assessments themselves. I think that's an important point. So I hope you can see how shifting the burden of validity from the assessment to the conclusions we draw clarifies an awful lot of issues and also makes it clear where we should be putting our efforts in terms of improving the validity of the conclusions we draw on the basis of assessment outcomes. So this is often described as the evidential basis. What does the result of the assessment mean? But we also have to remember that assessments are used in social situations with human beings who may change what they do as a result. And this has been called the consequential basis. What does, do the assessment's results do? And I think these two ideas of what do the results mean and what the assessment results do are the heart of Rick Stiggins' definition of assessment literacy. So the questions that he asks are, do you know what the assess these, this assessment result means in terms of a particular student? But you, we also have to remember that it may not be useful for its intended use. We also have to remember that assessments send messages to students and indeed other stakeholders about what we, out, what we value. Assessments often tell us what matters in a subject. And then finally, of course, we have to take into account the effect of this assessment on students. So we have to take into account both what assessment results mean and what assessment results do to students. And that's why Samuel Messick developed a rather comprehensive view of validity. He described it as an integrative evaluative judgment of the degree to which empirical evidence and theoretical rationales support the adequacy and appropriateness of inferences and actions based on test scores and other modes of assessment. So the idea is that we have to think about both what results mean and what they do. Now, Messick seems to have changed his view about the extent to which social consequences were important. Uh, Jim Popham um, beautifully encapsulated this by saying that social consequences of assessments were, were the right concern, but the wrong concept. And later on, Messick did in fact clarify that he actually thought that if good assessments were used badly, that was not the fault of the test maker. But if weaknesses in the assessment led to things that were unfortunate, then that was the fault of the assessment developer. So I think that we can actually be clear about the differences between validity and other aspects of social consequences by thinking about whether any of the blame, if you like, for this should go to the test developer as opposed to the person who uses the test. So if good tests are used for in, in ways that, are, that have negative social outcomes, that is actually not validity. It's a problem, but the, the problem is with the use of the test result, not, it can't be fixed by improving the assessment. Now, to, to push this argument further, I want now to deal with two particular issues, what are sometimes called threats to validity. And the first threat to validity is what is sometimes called construct irrelevant variance. And I know that sounds like the worst kind of psychological jargon, but here's the big idea. Sometimes assessments are too big. They assess things they shouldn't assess. So for example, in our reading test, in, in mathematics, sorry, in our mathematics test that had a lot of reading demand, the test partly assessed the mathematics that students had learned, but it also partly assessed reading ability. So some of the variation in the scores was caused by differences in how good the students were at mathematics. And some of the variation in the scores was caused by how good they were at reading. 
Now, if the test is meant to be about mathematics, that's the construct of interest, some of the variation is relevant to that construct. The variation that's due to differences in mathematical achievement is construct relevant. But the variance in the scores, the variation in the scores that's caused by reading ability is not meant to be something you're measuring in this assessment. It's construct irrelevant. So the point is that this is construct irrelevant variance because some of the variation in the scores is relevant to the thing you're looking at, some of it's not. And there are two kinds of construct relevant variance, systematic and random. So in the example I've just given you, all poor readers are, are affected by the reading demand of the test. So in, in that sense, there's a systematic uh, problem here, which is that the test requires them to be able to read well to be able to do the test. If different people grading the test use different criteria, and the score that a student gets depends on the person who does the grading, then that's effectively a random component. And so the random component of construct relevant variance is what we call reliability or unreliability. We want a student's score not to depend on who does the grading, on the, you know, the particular occasion the student was tested. And so that's why I was saying earlier that reliability is part of validity. We shouldn't talk about reliability and validity because reliability is part of validity. If the score a student gets is affected by random factors, it cannot possibly support valid inferences. And therefore, reliability is a part of validity. So we can talk about validity, including reliability. But to talk about reliability and validity is a bit like talking about cars and vehicles. The point is that one is completely subsumed within the other. The second problem with assessments is often that they actually fail to assess things they should. So for example, we often assess English language arts by tests of reading and tests of writing. But we don't often include assessments of speaking and listening which most people would say is part of English language arts. In other words, the assessment underrepresents the thing we're interested in, the construct of English language arts. And so these are the two problems. Construct irrelevant variance is when the assessment is too big. It assesses things it shouldn't assess. And construct underrepresentation is when it assesses things, when it fails to assess things that it should assess, like for example, an English test that doesn't include speaking and listening. Now, what's important here is that we often get debates about assessment, which appear to be debates about assessment, but turn out to be the arguments about what we mean by a particular subject. So one thing I often ask people is, can you assess historical thinking, ability in history, entirely with multiple choice tests? And some people think yes, and some people think no, and people adopt very strong positions um, on, on one or other side of the argument. The problem is they appear to be talking about assessment, they're really talking about history. So if you think that facts and dates are what history is all about, then you think multiple choice questions are pretty nifty because you can actually assess an awful lot of facts and dates very quickly. And in fact, you think essay questions about history, asking students to express historical insights in the form of an essay, are actually bad because they embody construct irrelevant variants. You're testing students' ability to write as well as their, their knowledge of history. On the other hand, people who think that history is about historical argument, about cause and effect, about chronology, then you think that any assessment that relies entirely on multiple choice questions underrepresents the construct of history. That's why you like essay questions, because they can actually get at the big ideas of history, cause and effect, chronology, reconciling conflicting doc documentary sources. The important point I want to make here is that it sounds like these people are arguing about the assessment, but they're not. They're arguing about the construct. They're arguing about what history is all about. And that's a really important point in terms of assessment. If you are clear about what you're assessing, then whether the assessment does support the inferences you want to support is primarily a technical matter. If you don't give the assessment developer that clarity, the assessment developer 
will end up intruding their own values, which gives the assessment developer far too much power. So a good construct definition is essential to getting good assessments because then constructing an assessment should be primarily a, a technical matter, not a values matter. Now I want to go on and spend a little bit of time talking about reliability because I think this is at the heart of effective use of assessments in schools. And if there was one issue that I'd want to bring up the agenda, it is an understanding of the importance of the fact that no assessment is perfectly reliable. So I said earlier, I wanted people to understand why a, a, a test can't be valid. I now want people to understand why a test can't be reliable. And the argument is slightly different. The argument for reliability is just that there's, it's a continuum. From zero, there is no information in this test score, to 100, this, this is perfectly stable as a measure of this student's achievement or ability in something that we've just tested. So the point is that reliability is a continuum. There's no such thing as perfect reliability. What we have is a continuum. Is it reliable enough for the purpose at hand? So I'd like to take you through an example. Let's say we've got a thousand words in a word bank that we want students to be able to spell. Now, we give them a test. We draw a sample of these thousand words and we give the students a test. What do we know if a student spells all 20 correctly? So I choose 20 of these thousand words and I give the students a test of, you know, can you spell these words? If a student can spell all 20 correctly, what do you know? Well, obviously, the more you, if you just choose one word, you don't know much, but if you sample 20 words, you can actually conclude the student probably knows a lot of the words in the, in, in the bank. If the questions, if the words that I chose were all the easy words and the student can spell them, I don't know much about the ability of the students to spell the words that weren't chosen. So the way the sample is drawn is really important. Sometimes a sample isn't random and therefore all you know is the students can spell the words you happen to sample. If the students knew which 20 words were going to be on the test and they can spell all 20 words correctly, we can't conclude anything about the words that were not tested because the students might just have prepared the 20 words that were tested. And of course, the amount of notice given. If we tell the students tomorrow we're going to test them, then what we can conclude is very different from if we give them six weeks notice or some other period of notice. So the important point is, you know, a sample of 20 words drawn from a bank of a thousand words might give us different results for the same student from day to day. So let's say, just take a concrete example. We ask a student to spell 20 of the words in the sample and five times on the same day, you know, we, we actually draw a sample of 20 and the first time the student gets 15 right, second time 17 right, third time 14 right, 15, 40. So on average, the student has scored 15 out of 20. So our best guess of how many items in that thousand word bank if those samples have been chosen randomly, is that the student probably knows about three-fourths of the total number in the item bank, and therefore that's about 750 words. Now, suppose we ask a different student, student and we get the answers 20, 12, 17, 10, 16. The average percentage correct is still 75%. So our best guess for this student is still that the student knows 750 of the thousand spellings. But now we are much less certain about our conclusion because these results were much more variable than in the first case. And reliability is just a, a way to try to quantify this, this, this certainty that we have about the meaning of a result. So how can we quantify this? Well, one way is of course, to actually take the difference from the average score so if the average score a student gets right is 15, then if they got 15, they got zero away from the correct answer. If they got 17 right, they got two more than was expected. If they got 14, there was minus one. And you might think we could actually add those up, but of course we can't because we always get zero because that's the definition of these numbers. They are the deviations from the average and therefore they add up to zero. What mathematicians do to get rid of awkward things like minus signs is to square the numbers. So what we do is we use a mathematical technique called the standard deviation to square the errors and then average them and square root 
and we end up with this number 1.2, which is how spread out the numbers are. If we do that for the second example, the average error is still zero, but now the errors in each particular testing occasion are now more spread out. The standard deviation is four. And the key statistic for any assessment is the standard deviation of the errors. So let's say we actually did this test many times across many students. We get this thing called the standard error of measurement, which is just our best guess about the average of the standard deviation of the errors of measurement over a specified group of test takers. So it's, it's about how far out from the average a student score might be on a particular occasion. So let's see what this means in practice. Let's take a test with an average score of 50 and a standard deviation of 15, so that most of the scores range from 20 to 80. When the reliability of the test is 0.7, the standard error of measurement is around about eight points. As the test gets more reliable, the standard deviation of the errors gets tighter and tighter, smaller and smaller. So we can see that the more reliable a test is, the standard error of measurement gets smaller. Or to think about it another way, when you have a smaller standard error of measurement, you get a, a higher reliability because the score a student gets is more likely to be an accurate guide to their, to their achievement across multiple takings of the same test. So what does this mean in practice? Well, let's say you've got a class of 25 students taking a reading test. And let's say that the test has a reliability of 0.85, which is about typical for a standardized reading test. And let's say that the scores are spread out as before, with ranging from 20 to 80. Then because of the less than perfect reliability of the test, students will get a score that might differ from their long run average. And we often call this the true score. Now, when we talk about a true score in measurement, in, in assessment, we don't mean the student has a fixed ability or anything like that. What we just mean is the true score is the long run average they would get if they took the same test many times. And 17 of the 25 students will get a score within, the, within six points of their true score, which is good. But seven students will get a score that is more than six points away from what they should have got in terms of multiple takings of the same test. And one student in that group of 25 will get a score that differs from their score, true score by more than 12 points. Unfortunately, we don't know which student this is, and we don't know whether the score they got was 12 points higher or 12 points lower than the one they should have got. And these are fundamental limitations of assessment. We can get more reliable assessments, but we do that in only one way. The only way to get reliable assessments is to spend more time testing. And so what I think we have to understand and accept is that we could have more reliable assessments, but only if we take more time testing. And therefore, the fact that our assessments aren't perfectly reliable, and there's a margin of error, is good. It means that we're not wasting a lot of time testing. But the price we pay for that is we have to be cautious about how we interpret these, these numbers that we generate from our standardized tests. This is particularly important when we try to measure student progress. So for example, in many schools now, they test students two or three times a year to see how much progress students are making. But it's important to remember that when you measure progress, what you're doing is subtracting one less than perfectly reliable number from another less than perfectly reliable number. And the change score is actually extremely unreliable. So let me give you an example. This is from a commercially produced standardized test, and I'm not gonna name the publisher because these are the good guys. These are the guys who actually make the information publicly available. So this is a standardized reading test, a ba um, batch or suite of tests, and the reliability is given there for each of the grades in the assessment. The average is 0.85. And what I've done there is, is express the standard error of measurement as a percentage of the annual progress. So for the second grade test, what this means is the error of measurement is over 50, 50% of the annual progress and the average across all six grades 
is about 49%, let's say 50%. So what this means is that if you test the students every six months and a student appears to have made six months progress, what you're really saying is this child has made six months progress, give or take six months. The error of measurement is equivalent to the progress made in six months. And I hope that gives you some indication of how unreliable progress measures are for individual students. If we look at another example, let's look at standardized, a standardized test where we actually give it at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, at the end of the year, and we see a student here has made steady progress. So they're getting, this is an average student, so they get a score of 210 on this standardized scale at the beginning of the year, and it gets slightly higher in the middle of the year, higher again at the end of the year. And that's great, isn't it? I mean, the student is making steady progress. But of course, we don't know that, because if you look at the possible trajectories, the error bars there show you what the error in those scores might be. And so if I add possible trajectories, that's the average student. But it could be the student made no progress at all, or it could be that they made twice as much progress as was, as was expected. So this is something we have to bear in mind whenever we use progress measures. They are highly unreliable for individual students. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. I think they can be very useful, but we have to be aware that the same set of scores could mean steady progress, no progress, or exceptional progress. Just to quantify this, if we had a class of 25 students, if they've all made the progress we would expect them to make, and they are tested with a typical reading test every six months. Four of the students will appear to have gone backwards or made no progress. Four will appear to have made twice as much progress as they really made. And again, you won't know which are which. So the important point is all assessments are unreliable. We need to know how much unreliability there is before we should attach any stakes at all to the results of these assessments. So to summarize, before we can assess, we need clear models of progression. The validity of our assessments depends on the inferences we draw from the assessments, not the assessments themselves. And there are two kinds of problems here. One is the assessment is too big. It assesses things it shouldn't assess. And the other is the assessment is too small. It fails to assess things it should have assessed. And the, the, the reliability of the assessment is key to understanding what we're allowed to conclude. If the test scores themselves aren't reliable, then we're not able to conclude anything about the meaning of these results because the student would have got a different score on a different day. The limited reliability of tests, the less than perfect reliability of tests, has particularly stark consequences for change scores. And the final point, as I mentioned a few minutes earlier, assessments are important for what they do as well as what they mean, because they have social consequences, they change what students do in classrooms. Okay, so um, and now we're going on to the, uh, the, the questions part, and I don't know whether people have been submitting questions. Beth? Yes, uh, they have. I'm yep. going to read a couple to you. Sure. So, it says, uh, what about on a reading test where the construct is, say, identifying the theme, but the construct is confounded by requiring the student to decode in order to respond to the question? Well, the key thing is whether you think identifying the theme is part of the construct or not. So people will have an argument about this because some people think that obviously decoding is part of that construct, but I would argue that it's also quite sensible to say, certainly from a diagnostic point of view, adopting the simple view of reading, I would say, let's try to figure out what's going wrong here. And I would say that if the students could do that through listening comprehension, if, they were spoke, if, they, if, if the text was spoken to them and they understood it, then they can actually figure out the meaning, they can actually do the interpretation. So the decoding is, I would say, contra irrelevant variance, but other people would say that the decoding has to be there because otherwise it's underrepresenting the construct 
The important point is that people are arguing about the assessments, not because they're arguing about the assessments really, they're really arguing about whether decoding is part of the construct or not. That's why concept, sorry, construct definition is so important. Let's be clear about whether decoding is or is not part of the construct we're interested in, and then we can answer the question. Okay, uh, next question. When you say learning progressions, do you mean that as a general statement or the learning progressions such as like uh, Briggs, it says? Like what? Like Briggs, B-R-I-G-G-S. Hmm? I'm not sure which uh, which learning progressions that's, is, is, is that Derek Briggs or is that Myers Briggs? Anyway, um, for me, the learning progressions are models. So they are the sequence of stages through which most students typically progress. So I would say that to be useful, a learning progression has to be one that at least 50% of the students would follow. If, if you've got a learning progression that only a third of the students are actually following and other students learn in much more complex ways, I would say the learning progression stops being very useful. We're never going to get any learning progressions that all students follow because some students learn in a very different way. So I would say at least 50% and probably settle for 85, 90%. So for me, a learning progression is a model of how the majority of students typically progress in this subject. But we have to also recognize that many students will not fit that model. Okay. Uh, let's see, next question says, does that mean that all MCQs are affected by the random threat to validity? Um, yes, but not because of the reasons that people normally assume. So multiple choice questions tend to be answered, tend to be scored quite reliably. So there's, there's still difficulties with, with, with erasures. If a student has erased an answer and then reinserted an answer, it can be a matter of some debate about which answer they actually meant. But typically we can score multiple choice questions quite reliably. But if we have a thousand possible questions in an item bank, and we choose 50 of these multiple choice questions, the point is that some students will do better depending on which 50 were chosen. So reliability, unreliability is always a feature of any assessment. With a slightly different set of questions being included in the assessment, many students will get a, a slightly different score. If you don't know how much of a difference, then I don't think you should be placing any weight on the score a student gets. Okay, thank you. So can you take a few more? We have quite sure. a few actually. It says, um, do you not agree that formative and summative assessments are designed with varying degrees of proximity to the taught curricula? For example, on a summative assessment, the items would have a more distal relationship to the taught curricula, and on a formative assessment, the items would have a more proximal relationship. Otherwise, how could we infer whether or not the student's understanding of the concepts is dependent solely on the context of the taught curricula? Well, ultimately, we always want distal measures of student achievement. So the danger with formative assessment is we only check that the students have understood exactly the point that we were teaching them today, and they only have to understand it for today. So as Paul Kirshner and his colleagues say, learning is a change in long-term memory. So ultimately, I want students to be able to apply this stuff six weeks later in novel contexts. So for me, I think that the, the, the sensitivity of the, let's be clear what we're talking about here, whether something is a proximal or a distal measure is really the sensitivity of the assessment to the instruction, how closely it's matching the instruction in terms of what's being measured here. And for me, with these are independent dimensions. So we have the sensitivity of instruction measured from immediate to remote with distal and proximal being important stepping stones along the way. And the other is the formative summative dimension. And I can see occasions in which I want a summative assessment that is quite close to the stuff that was actually taught and other cases when I want it much more remote and same for summative. So for me, so I say for formative. So for me, the, the, the independent dimensions and I think that maybe we do tend to want more uh, measures close to the instruction when we're functioning, when looking for formative conclusions, but I don't think it's always the case. 
Okay, thank you. Next one. Would construct irrelevant variants be the corollary of construct underrepresentation? I.e., is there if there is a construct underrepresentation, then you will necessarily have construct irrelevation variants. No, we all, I mean, basically, typically most assessments have both. They're two different kinds of threat to validity. So if I have a math test with a high reading demand, it will actually have construct irrelevant variance because part of the variation in scores is due to kids' differences in well, how well they can read. But the test might also have construct underrepresentation. So if I have a, a test on arithmetic that happens to test addition, subtraction, and multiplication, but not division, it's missing out an important part of the assessment. So in other words, the same assessment can suffer from both contract irrelevant variance and contract underrepresentation, but in different ways. Okay, thank you for that. Next one says, as tests and the validity of the inferences from the results are such complex ideas, do you think giving students test scores results is ever useful or should tests only be used as diagnostic tools for teachers? I think students should be given test scores provided they're accompanied by margins of error. So we say to students, you know, student, student, okay, you got 65 and the pass mark is 70. So the student says, did I pass? Teacher says, probably not, but you might have done. You know, you might actually on a different day get a higher score. Why don't you know? Because the test isn't perfectly reliable. Why can't you make the test more reliable? Because that would involve making it longer and taking time away from teaching you stuff. So the idea is in individual tests have a margin of error. And I think we should tell the students that, which is to say, you know, the margin of error here is plus or minus 10. And I think people can understand that in opinion polling data. So why not with an assessment? The important point is for grade point average, it doesn't matter because typically a grade point average is made by averaging a large number of percentages across a whole course and that means that the errors cancel out because they're random so although a, a one individual score might have a margin of error of 10 points when you've got lots of different assessments the margins of error are much much smaller and therefore the average across a large number of assessments is usually a pretty good guide in terms of reliability at least those scores are quite reliable those averages I mean, they might not be valid, they might not be actually um, supporting valid interpretations because they might not be assessing the right stuff, but their point is that they are reasonably reliable when you're aggregating lots of different scores together. Okay, Dylan, thank you for that. I'm going to read two more questions to you, but I want you to know there are a huge number of questions in this webinar okay. today. So to let everyone know, we will um, find a way to work to get responses to you. Um, the best that we can on the um, remaining questions. So um, last two questions. First one, in terms of measuring progress, would it be better to compare the rank order of pupils rather than their individual score? No, rank orders are almost always worse than scores because you're throwing away the magnitude of differences. So basically rank orders, you know, I might beat you by one point, I might beat you by 10 points. And say so if, if we just reduce that rank order to your second and I'm uh, I, your second and I'm first, we're throwing away information, and throwing away information is never a good idea. And so, therefore, in general, I would say that ranks are almost always less useful than scores. The point about scores is we can actually c calculate margins of error. So the important point to say is, you know, you got forty-three, I got forty-eight, but the margin of error is ten. So I don't know that I'm better than you. And I think that would actually defuse a lot of the conversations that happen when people try to overinterpret small differences in scores. Okay, thank you. Last question and then we'll move on to our final slide. So it says, how might you get principals, leaders and policymakers to understand this so they avoid making inaccurate inferences and misusing results? Great question. It is a great question and it's something I've been struggling with um, and, and that's going to be something I hope to be dealing with in my next book. Uh, basically, I want to let the genie out of the bottle. I want people to embrace margins of error. We've kept it quiet because it's a bit embarrassing. So we've got this kind of guilty secret that we hope that people don't notice. And that's why we over interpret our assessment data. 
So my response is, let's have the genie out of the bottle. Let's be upfront about measurement error. Let's say it's a problem. Let's say, actually, it's a good problem because it means we're not spending all our time testing and try to get more informed debate. My own experience talking to parents, for example, is when they understand the concept of margin of error, they don't tend to rely over much on one single test score. So I think embracing the unreliability or the less than perfect reliability of assessments is a way to move the conversation on so that people can actually take assessment data into account, but not overinterpret it. Okay, super. Thank you very much, Dylan. Appreciate your taking those questions today. And again, there were many more, so we'll have to circle back to a bunch of folks on the webinar today. So uh, the topics we covered today are the cornerstone of the formative, the formative Assessment National Conference we're holding this July in Baltimore, Maryland. And in addition to thought-provoking sessions, networking, and PD opportunities, the conference will feature a special panel discussion on the future of assessment featuring our one and only Dr. Dylan William, Rick Stiggins, and authors Susan Brookhart and Todd J. McTighe. To show our appreciation for attending today's webinar, we're providing you with a registration discount for the Formative Assessment National Conference. You can see the discount code on the screen. Once you visit the conference website at dylanwilliamcenter.com conference, use the discount code LSIDWW. We will also include this information in our follow-up email to you after this webinar. So again, thank you for attending and watch your email for a link to this webinar and information on formative assessment national conference. Dr. William, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.